I am Sharon Prince, the founder and president of Grace Farms Foundation. And for those of you that are here for the first time, Grace Farms is a new kind of public place that was built to be a nexus for the public and private sectors. And we create this platform that you can see is embedded into nature for significant justice work and to be a place of grace and peace. So our stake in the ground is to disrupt and end modern day slavery. We aim to catalyze and change the world through Grace Farms and all five of our initiatives. That's nature, arts, justice, community, and faith. And our initiatives are distinct in purpose, yet complementary. So with an entrepreneurial lens and leadership from best-in-class experts, our approach allows for people from different fields and perspectives to influence each other's conversations and work in a reflective yet dynamic manner, and often driving new outcomes and breakthroughs that move the needle on one of the most pressing humanitarian issues of our time. So tonight, we are hosting a discussion on the ongoing conflicts in the Middle East and their importance to US national security and values, including human dignity and freedom with the Institute for the Study of War. Led by its sharply focused founder, she's highly decorated herself. She is a military historian, Dr. Kimberly Kagan. And we are honored also to have the ISW's Director of Research, the brilliant Jennifer Caffarella, along with his distinguished board members, General David Petraeus and Connecticut's Senator Joseph Lieberman. And we're all, they're all here to help us and to drive new and enduring solutions to political, security, and humanitarian problems caused by the ongoing Middle East conflict, including human trafficking. So with more than 40 million victims worldwide, slavery is the second largest global criminal industry and often remains an unseen reality as the outcome of migration in areas where there's war and conflict. So contemporary slavery is an issue that must be disrupted at the systemic level with inputs and action from all sectors. So this approach challenges corporations to address their supply chains and new policies to be enacted. Funding and space for training law enforcement, support for media campaigns to drive awareness of the issue and public advocacy, of which we have one in the, in the ready. And I see uh, Carl here who helped us from WPP to initialize something called Unchain, if you don't know um, about that. If you just look that up, that's something that's gonna be launching at the end of the year. And then also for a platform for experts, like the Institute for the Study of War, to help us understand the on-the-ground implications of military affairs. So Grace Farms is a platform that can accelerate this work and lead to new outcomes. We believe that these outcomes emerge from bringing diverse communities together to share perspectives and thoughtful, productive dialogue. In this room tonight, I'm sure we have a broad range of perspectives on military operations, and that's essential. So gatherings like this with ISW provide an opportunity to learn from each other and to discern our civic responsibilities. So two months ago, I was in the Golan Heights with Israeli friends and service women and men in the Israeli Defense Forces Iron Dome Mobile Unit. And I must acknowledge that it was a significant moment for me to see gender parity within the context of the troops that were there and also within their leadership. It was pretty incredible. And then we were right within view of the Syrian border and we met with the founding commander of IDF's Operation Good Neighbor, which provides humanitarian aid to, there's about, there's many, um, there's about 200,000 residents in the southwest corner of Syria, in this Haran region. And what they do is they do this by still maintaining Israelis' non-involvement uh, you know, policy within this conflict. So with, since 2016, there have been about 110 aid operations, which is pretty incredible, and about 4,000, they handled medical infrastructure, and about 4,000 of those um, people were brought into Israel, treated at the hospitals, and then brought back. So it's, it, was, it was really something I never knew about. And then when I spoke with ISW team over here, we, they, they're very familiar with Operation Good Neighbor. And they'll, they'll probably address that further, something very, you know, you'll, I think you'll find interesting there. 
So, bring it back to Grace Farms, over the past three years, since opening 2015, under the leadership of Radhika Tabi and Krishna Patel, who joined us straight from the DHS, HSI, decorated himself, and the DOJ for our justice programs, they become a catalyst for global systemic change. So we advise and train international, federal, state, and local law enforcement in successfully combating and prosecuting national and transnational organized crime involved in human trafficking and illegal wildlife trafficking on a local, national, and global level. So the international trainings are conducted in Africa, Europe, and Asia by enhancing capacity of law enforcement agencies, prosecutors, social service providers, as well as strengthening networks for regional law enforcement to increase investigative collaboration. So we are on the front lines and thrilled that you are all here as engaged citizens and also leaders in the public and private sector to learn from this distinguished panel with who I'm sure is going to point us to actionable humanitarian steps. So please welcome our highly effective, effective Director of Law Enforcement Risk Officer, Rod Katabi, who's gonna frame this conversation and introduce the panel. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you all for being here. I would also like to acknowledge that we have so many veterans in the audience, so many amazing people, like Jerry Melle, a 94-year-old veteran and earth science teacher. <laughs> From New York, who wrote a poem for General Petraeus, and we'll be talking about this poem later on. Jerry served during World War II, assigned to a submarine unit, and has done nine war patrols. We also have many veterans here. Drew Mason, who served as an intelligence officer during Operation Desert Storm for the USS Abraham Lincoln. His father, Ted Mason, was also here, a retired US Navy captain. Bill Roberty, a retired colonel from the U.S. Army is here too. Ted O'Hallen, a retired U.S. Navy captain. Al Sharkney, a former corporal with the U.S. Marine Corps who was awarded the Presidential Lifetime Award, Achievement Award. Many years ago, Al and I used to prepare candidates for the Naval Special Warfare, SEAL and EODs. I stopped, he's still doing it. Full force, thank you. Thank you so much, Al, for your continued support. We have so many true heroes here who served our country, and what I'd like to do, please join me in welcome, welcoming all our veterans and thanking them for their service. I am the Director of Law Enforcement and Risk Officer at Grace Farms Foundation. In late 2015, I retired as a special agent overseeing the New Haven, Connecticut office with the United States Department of Homeland Security. And I joined Grace Farms Foundation to help implement the vision of our founder and president, Sharon Prince, to advance good in the world. Grace Farms is a place where we agree to disagree with respect and have great substantive dialogues with potential solution. Uh, like Albert Einstein said, the mind is like a parachute. It only works if we keep it open. <laughs> and that brings us to this great event tonight, Humanitarian Impact of conflict in the Middle East. Our distinguished panel will attempt to cover many national security issues. It seems to me that more and more countries are experiencing some form of violent conflict. People are living, living in conflict, affected areas may suffer from abuse, violence, and exploitation, including trafficking in person. According to the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugee, by the end of 2017, 
more than 68 million people were forcibly displaced worldwide. As a result of persecution, conflict, violence, or human rights violations. The high number of refugees just enhances the risk of people to become victims of human trafficking. The need to flee war and persecution just fuels exploitation. Human trafficking is largely undertaken by the Islamic State, Boko Haram, Al Shabaab, and other terrorists or armed groups. Armed groups use trafficking as part of the strategy to increase their military power and economic resources, but also to project violence, a violent image of themselves, and instill fear in local populations. So our panel will also discuss the role of the United States. What is our current state of affairs? Our strategy usually towards the Middle East has always been to maintain security and stability in the region of geostrategic importance. Now the question is, is it still the same? Currently we have seen some changes that are bringing some countries in the Middle East to be more active in their foreign policies with their neighbors, such as the war in Yemen that has brought this hardening humanitarian impact. These changes would bring divides among U.S. allies in the Middle East. Now, should we be careful to also ensure that our allies in those countries stay together and continue to help us in countering radical terrorist groups, protecting our economic interests, helping Iraq to reach its democratic potential, and how about Syria? What is going on with Syria? Can we create effective security structure if Qatar is on bad terms with the United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, and Bahrain? And also, what is happening with Saudi Arabia and Oman? Currently, they don't seem to get along. There are so, so many questions needing some answers. Like, where are we with the increasing influence of Russia, China, and Iran in the Middle East, especially in Syria and Iraq? What is going on with the Middle East Strategic Alliance Project? The goal of that alliance is to mainly contribute to peace and security in the region and the world, as well as addressing the political and economic arenas. How is this US-led project being received in the Middle East? How do we deal with distinct histories, cultures, and societies? How should we react to this evolving dramatic events happening in the Middle East? The lack of progress towards human rights and economic freedom, Syria, difficult relations with Turkey, and the continuous threat of transnational terrorism. Should our policy, policies rely on the Middle East population opinions instead of the government? Maybe then the governments would probably be more responsive to popular sentiment. Do we need to continue to assist other countries to adopt our American values? So none, none of these challenges, questions have good or easy answers. As General Petraeus said, we need to learn from our experiences and take responsibilities for our actions and drive on. We did make mistakes and we need to listen more carefully. I truly believe that results will come from within those countries in collaboration with the United States intervention. It is indeed a learning progress. Also, as Senator Lieberman said, and I quote, I believe that our national security lies not just in protecting our borders, but in bridging divides. Bridging divides. So the U.S. strategy can only be as successful as its strategic partners help make it. I truly believe people who are part of the problem should be part of the solution. Regional partnerships remain vital, and we must persist in promoting human rights and economic freedom, 
pursue the peace process and continue to sustain alliances. So now for me, it is time to introduce the Institute for the Study of War, ISW. It is a nonprofit, nonpartisan public policy research organization based in Washington, D.C. The Institute is committed to advancing informed U.S. national security policies. Founded by Dr. Kimberly Kagan in 2007, ISW continues to be a trusted voice in Washington and beyond. It does not accept funds from the U.S. government or from foreign governments in order to maintain its independence. It relies on support from a growing community of U.S. citizens and private sector organizations. Now I'd like to talk about our panelists, introduce them a little bit. I will start with Dr. Kimberly Kagan. She is the founder and president of ISW. She is a military historian, like Sharon said, who has published three books and taught at the U.S. Military Academy in West Point, Yale, Georgetown, and American University. Kimberly conducted strategic reviews for theater commanders in Iraq and Afghanistan from 2007 to 2010. She served as a volunteer in Kabul for 17 months from 2010 to 2012. For commanders of the International Security Assistance Force, General David Petraeus and subsequently General John Allen, for which she received a public service award from the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. She now serves on the congressionally appointed bipartisan Syria Study Group. Now, Senator Joseph Lieberman, now senior counsel at the law firm at Kessowitz Benson Torres in New York, Joe Lieberman was for 24 years a member of the United States Senate from Connecticut. At the end of his service in January 2013, he was chairman of the Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs Committee and a senior member of the Armed Services Committee. Through both committee positions, he became a leader in protecting the security of the American people and supporting American international leadership. Senator Lieberman is known as a national leader who works across party lines to get things done and, he, and who speaks his conscience regardless of the polit political consequences. Before his election to the Senate in 1988, Senator Lieberman served 10 years in the Connecticut State Senate and six years as Connecticut Attorney General. In 2000, he was the Democratic candidate for Vice President of the United States. Jennifer Caffarella is the Research Director at the Institute for the Study of War, ISW. She is responsible for setting the organization's research priorities and overseeing the execution by ISW team of open source intelligence analysts. Jennifer is also responsible for leading ISW simulations exercises, as well as its efforts to develop detailed recommendation, recommendations on how to achieve US objective abroad. Jennifer led ISW's Syria team from 2014 to 2017 before becoming ISW's director of intelligence and planning. And now General Petraeus, the last but absolutely not the least. This amazing general has done so much for our country and the world. And you know, I wrestled really with the idea of introducing General Petraeus in a few seconds. And then lucky, I received an email from Pat Melly. The email contained a poem the poem, do you remember I said, that I was written approximately five years ago by our 94-year-old veteran, Jerry Melly. He wrote it for General Petraeus. And here's an excerpt that I feel says it all. Jerry wrote, and I quote, General David Petraeus is a man I admire for serving our country as a great rectifier Highly respected by his military staff, his concern was always on our country's behalf. Thank you, Jerry.
Amazing, isn't it? When I got that email, I thought, this couldn't be true. And you know what? I researched it. It is true. And I spoke to General Petraeus, too. So just to make sure. So David Petraeus is a partner with the global investment firm KKR and the chairman of the KKR Global Institute. He is a Judge Whitney professor at the University of Southern California, a senior fellow at Harvard University Belfast Center, co-chairman of the Woodrow Wilson Institute Global Advisory Council, senior vice president of the Royal United Services Institute, and a member of the boards of the Institute for the Study of War, the Atlantic Council, and seven veteran service organizations. General David Petraeus concluded his 37 years in uniform with six consecutive commands, including the surge in Iraq, the U.S. Central Command, and the International Security Assistance Force in Afghanistan, after which he served as the director of CIA. General Petraeus was also widely recognized for leadership in preparing U.S. Army leaders and units for deployment to combat and oversaw the drafting of the counterinsurgency field manual that guided the surge. A graduate with distinction from the United States Military Academy, he also earned a PhD in international relations and economics from Princeton, and later completed a fellowship at Georgetown University's School of Foreign, for Foreign Service. So ladies and gentlemen, we appreciate your questions and we'd like to hear from you. We use a web-based platform called Light, uh, Slido, which you can access by opening your browser on your device and entering the link you see in your program. If you type in slido.com forward slash Grace Farms, it will take you directly to the Q&A platform where you can ask our panelists direct questions. Again, it's slido.com forward slash Grace Farm. And for our veterans, it's Sierra, Lima, India, Delta, Oscar, Dad, Charlie, Oscar, Mike, forward slash, Golf, Romeo, Alpha, Charlie, Echo, Foxtrot. <laughs> All right, so that is Grace Farms, and that is forward slash. So without any further delay, please join me, please join me in welcoming our distinguished panelists. Sharon, thank you so much for hosting us this evening. The Institute for the Study of War is so proud uh, to be here with you and the incredible community that the Grace Farms Foundation has put together to discuss an issue that is so important to both organizations, uh, and that is the incredible responsibility uh, that we as humans have to other humans, uh, even in times of conflict. Um, and I think what you have done here at Grace Farms is really an embodiment of the extraordinary vision uh, that you have in your commitment uh, to making the world a better place. So thank you, Sharon, for all that you've done, and thanks to all of you for coming this evening. So I... I'm overwhelmed to be here with two of my board members, uh, but also two of the Great people, exactly two of the people I most admire. Um, and it is uh, wonderful, actually, to be with you to talk about uh, conflict in the Middle East and its humanitarian consequences. So General Petraeus, Senator Lieberman, thank you for joining us tonight. Probably. Thank and you. Jenny, I pay you, but thank you, thank you too. <laughs> thank you for paying me. Yeah. Well, well, David and I pay you. So <laughs> All's fair. <laughs> and we're happy to. We get the raise every year. <laughs> well, um, tonight uh, we're going to begin by talking about, I think, uh, it, one of the most interesting, complicated, and tragic conflicts underway, the war in Syria, just as an avenue to the many questions that Rod asked at the beginning of this panel. Um, it's a humanitarian tragedy. Uh, it's an international conflict. Um, 
Jenny, one of the things that you have done is helped me to understand Syria. Um, tell us, how is that war going? Has Assad won it? Sure, thanks Kim, and thanks again to the Grace Farms Foundation for hosting us here tonight. I think the most important thing to know up front about the war in Syria is that it is actually far from over. The Assad regime, with significant military support from Russia and Iran, have achieved major gains on the battlefield and are attempting to convince the world to accept their victory and actually to invest in what they call reconstruction, but is in fact an attempt by the Assad regime to give reparations in the form of financial support to both Russia and Iran to repay them for supporting the slaughter of his population. The war in Syria is far from over, and it's a source of incredible grief for Syria, for the wider region, and for those of us who have watched and tried to play a positive role in crafting a better American policy in that war. But the fact that this, the war in Syria is far from over is also actually a source of hope. Assad has failed to impose his, win, his will on his population. The incredible bravery of the Syrian population to resist his tyranny and to have the audacity to demand the freedoms that we here as Americans enjoy remains constant. Unfortunately, that means Syria will continue to be embroiled in a conflict because Assad may have won some important gains on the ground, but he actually cannot hold on to them. We've already seen a return of insurgent activity and once again, peaceful popular protests in areas that he ostensibly retook only a year ago. The Syrian revolution has returned to the province of Dara, bordering Jordan and the Golan Heights, which is where the revolution first began. If Assad cannot secure his country, then why should the international community actually accept his victory? It is not a victory. And in fact, it's going to lead to a new phase of the war in which if the US does not act and does not carefully evaluate the risks of inaction, we actually could witness the return of the Islamic State and we could witness Al Qaeda actually take over what was once a popular and pro-democracy rebellion inside of Syria. There is a capable Al Qaeda affiliate the Assad regime has not focused on defeating it, and had instead focused on defeating the moderate opposition. So the war is going to continue. We also have four foreign military forces fighting now in Syria, demonstrating the internationalization of the conflict that Kim mentioned, which will add further fuel, unfortunately, to this fire and will ensure that it will likely continue for a decade or more to come. Those foreign forces include the Russians and the Iranians, as I've mentioned, includes the US military forces deployed in eastern Syria to fight ISIS, and it includes the Turkish army, which has invaded and occupied a portion of Syria and does not intend to leave anytime soon. So I think it's very important as we consider the humanitarian impact of this war to recognize that half of Syria's population has been displaced by the war and the refugees are not returning home. Assad has made clear that they understand that if they do return, voluntary or otherwise, they face exactly the same conditions of tyranny that originally drove them to flee. So I think as we consider humanitarian approaches that the US should take, we should consider those refugees and the vital support that they need and recognize that dumping them back into Syria is not the answer, nor in my view is it morally acceptable. We face a similar problem with displaced persons that lived under ISIS and a flow of traumatized children that emerged from the final vestiges of the caliphate in southeastern Syria, which actually surprised the United States and our local partner on the ground. There is something like 30,000 children in a single IDP camp, internally displaced persons camp in northeastern Syria alone, that grew up under ISIS and have known little else. They are not receiving life-saving medical care, and in fact, many have actually died under those conditions. We face an urgent requirement to act in the part of Syria where we are already deployed in order, again, to fight ISIS. But we have to make sure that as we continue to engage on the ground in the East, that we do not continue to suffer from a tunnel vision and ignore what is happening in Western Syria. That conflict in the West is not contained to the West. It will continue to drive additional refugee flows into Europe if we're not careful. And so I fear we do face both an urgent requirement to act now and a long-term requirement to develop a strategy actually to enable the Syrians that rose up in pursuit of democracy, hopefully, ultimately, to achieve that dream. General Petraeus? Well, I, first of all, look, it's just wonderful to be here. I feel like I've sort of deployed to Fort Tranquility or something like that here. <laughs> um, and, and it really is a privilege to 
uh, see all of you, frankly, on a rainy night uh, to be with the founder and president and CEO of an, an organization that Senator Lieberman and I both uh, respect enormously and have since way, way back uh, when it was first founded. I, you know, Kim and her husband, it's the doctors, Kagan, actually. I remember they came to Afghanistan for two weeks, and we let them go home after a year. They were that valuable. Um, so it is a privilege to be with them. It's a privilege to be with Jennifer. You heard why she is so respected and so exceptional in her analysis. She has essentially lived the war in Syria uh, all the way back to when I think I was the director of the CIA. We probably tried to hire her a few times, but couldn't pry her loose. Uh, but a it, it, true honor to be with, um, I think, the greatest senator of your state in anyone's memory. Uh, a truly courageous individual. Um, he was one hanging chad away from being the vice president of the United <laughs> States. Um, and you know, when the chips were really down uh, in Iraq, uh, when there was a threat, there was a sense that it was just completely lost, give it up, throw in the towel, let's lose gracefully, or something like that. Uh, there were really three members of the Senate who truly hung in there with us. Uh, we called them the three amigos. Uh, they were Senators McCain, McCain, Lieberman, and Graham, and I will always be grateful uh, to them for that and for a lot of other things, and I thank you for that, Senator. Look, what I wanted to add here is I think that one of the lessons that we should have learned maybe decades ago, but certainly in the last two decades, is to be very cautious about declaring victory or mission accomplished or anything along those lines, uh, and to be much more measured in your assessments of what it is that we have accomplished. Um, the truth is that each of the previous two presidents succumbed to that at one point. Uh, we realized that that was, again, uh, a bit premature. Uh, in each case, we had to convict, commit a lot more resources uh, ultimately to that. Uh, and I think we have to be very careful about that right now. It is true that we have defeated the Islamic State as an army, as an example. We have not defeated the Islamic State that is still an insurgent group. Many of the army elements broke up into insurgent and terrorist cells. And we haven't defeated the ideology that galvanizes not just the Islamic State, but Al-Qaeda and a variety of other Islamist extremist organizations around the world with which we'll be contending for at least a generation. So we need to have a sustained uh, commitment to this. And then last, we have certainly not taken away, as we've taken away the ground caliphate, we have not taken away the cyber caliphate that the Islamic State still enjoys. Even though we destroyed the actual facility from which they ran their uh, internet operations, killed or captured many of the individuals that were the brains behind that particular component of it. Yeah. Uh, and so again, I think you have to be very careful uh, about getting impatient, uh, about uh, going home, uh, because you may end up having to go back there. And I think it's important not just to have a sustained campaign, but of course to have a sustainable campaign. And I think what we have learned, and I think a credit uh, to probably each of the three, the current and the previous two administrations, is that we gradually figured out how to do this. We got the capabilities. Senator Lieberman was a champion of this as well, along with then chairman of the Center Armed Services Committee, uh, McCain, got us the wherewithal to do this, the constellation of drones, the industrial strength ability to fuse intelligence, the precision strike capabilities which have enabled us to support others who are doing the fighting on the front lines, who are doing the, so much of the nation building, which is great because that is very, very costly, needless to say, not just in treasure, but also in blood, and it is their country after all. So I think we have actually figured this out to a degree. Uh, we will never stop learning, as, and thank you for the kind uh, introduction uh, prior to us taking the stage, but as we noted, we have to continue to learn from this. Um, you can't close a mind any more than you should close a parachute uh, in mid-flight, and I'm an old paratrooper who actually learned what happens if your parachute collapses. Um, it's not to be repeated, uh, unless you enjoy fractured pelvises, which is quite a, one of life's great experiences. Um, so, so again, I think this is very, very important uh, as a takeaway. And what 
Jennifer has described is a lot of elements with which uh, we, our coalition, our host nation partners, uh, and others around the world need to contend. Uh, and if we don't, by the way, the, the other big lesson from these experiences is that unfortunately Las Vegas rules do not apply in the Middle East or Central Asia or a variety of other places where Islamist extremists uh, have managed to take advantage of ungoverned or inadequately governed spaces. Rather, what happens, it doesn't stay there. They tend to spew violence, extremism, and a tsunami of refugees, not just into neighboring countries, but all the way, as we saw in the case of Syria, half of those population was displaced. She didn't mention half of that was displaced outside the country and much of that into Europe. And we've seen what that has done to the democracies of Europe. It has created the biggest populist challenges for those democracies, certainly since the end of the Cold War. So all of this, again, is a real caution uh, that because of humanitarian reasons, because of security reasons, because of reasons of supporting uh, the freedoms and ideals uh, for which would li I'd like to believe that we were fighting in uniform, defending in the, co in the Congress and so forth, uh, that we have to continue these efforts, but doing it in a way that we have gradually figured out uh, how to accomplish uh, with ways that are sustainable in terms of blood and treasure. Senator Lieberman, you, uh, in your time in the Senate, actually observed some of the beginnings of the Syrian conflict. Um, tell us what, what was so singularly important about it for the United States of America? Uh, thank you. Thanks, uh, Kim. Thanks, Dave, for your kind words about me. They uh, it would mean a lot to me coming from anybody in my home state, in front of my wife. <laughs> Especially coming, if they voted. <laughs> right, coming from you, uh, they mean an awful lot. I mean, one of the reasons that, uh, I wouldn't say it was easy, but in the end I knew I was doing the right thing and supporting the surge was because you were going to carry it out. And I just had enormous confidence in you. Uh, General Petraeus is a general, if I can change the title, of the film, a, a general and a gentleman, a scholar and a, a patriot, really. He, he is very unusual. The, the generals like this and leaders like this don't come along um, uh, in every generation. I mean, really, you have to go back to General Marshall or somebody like that to have a person of this breadth. Anyway, I appreciate it. And um, to call this Camp Tranquility, Fort Tranquility. Fort, Fort Tranquility. We've, we've expanded. We've raised it up. So I, I had an immediate association with one of my uh, favorite movies, Field of Dreams, when uh, uh, the players come out of the cornfields and they say, is this heaven? And he says, no, this is Iowa. <laughs> so I say to you, is this Fort Tranquility? No, this is New Canaan, Connecticut. <laughs> anyway. so. I, <laughs> It's a, a small state, as the Supreme Court once said a long time ago, but there are those of us who love it. It has very uh, many beautiful places. And uh, just really thanks to Sharon and the Prince Foundation for what, the beauty you've added to this natural setting and the beauty of, of what you've invited in here. Anyway, it's an honor to be here. Um, we're here for uh, Institute for the Study of War, but the uniqueness, I, I, I wanted to say something about what a special place it is, how it uh, performs a unique function uh, and is depended upon by members of Congress and members of the executive branch of both parties uniquely. But I don't have to say a word after what Jen said in her opening statement, because you had the combination of tremendous knowledge, really informed, and then a passion about the consequences of uh, what's happened there for real people. and. Um, you know, that's, look, we, America has always been at our best in foreign and defense policy when we've been true to our values. And our values are very clearly stated, and we can't repeat them enough in the Declaration of Independence. Those self-evident truths that everybody, every man, woman, uh, everywhere is, is created equal and endowed by our creator 
with the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I mean, the founders said in the second paragraph, that's the reason they were founding America. So that's our purpose. We were defined by our values before, really, we were defined by our borders. Our borders weren't that clear or secure then uh, at all. And it's, it, we live in an imperfect world. So it's not always possible to be as true to our values and foreign policy as we'd like to be and should be, but we're always better when we are. And here's a case, Syria, um, where not only were our values on the line from the beginning, particularly the value of freedom. I remember uh, John McCain and I were in Egypt. We were there after the Arab Spring uprising. We'd been to Tunisia and then Egypt. And we heard about the uh, uprising in uh, Syria. And it was honestly about freedom. It was about human dignity. Incidentally, what we found out from the people in um, Tunisia and Egypt, it was not only about political freedom, it was about economic opportunity. They, they all concluded that the ruling families of the country were uh, depriving them of the opportunity to rise and uh, the stealing all the money of, of the government. So right away it felt to, to me and us, I would say, that America's values, our whole, the basic uh, 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 foundation points of our system, human freedom, uh, economic freedom, were on the line in what was happening in Syria, and we right away called for some kind of support for the freedom fighters. And what followed um, in, um, uh, really, administrations of both parties was a failure of will um, uh, because I think of the concern, it was post-Afghanistan, post-Iraq fatigue, but uh, you know, there's a wonderful old Mark Twain line about the cat who jumps on a hot stove and gets burned, screams, jumps off the stove, and never jumps on the stove again because the cat thinks the stove is always flaming hot, but we're smarter than that. Um, we can distinguish between uh, conflicts and where we really belong. And in Syria, I think though there is always risk to leadership and action, even when you're doing it for the best of your values, uh, th this is a, 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 t a case, a, a powerful uh, a study of the costs of inaction I mean, uh, hundreds of thousands, depends who you talk to, a million people killed, millions of displaced people inside and external refugees. And as Dave said, uh, it's not like it's over there, which I think a lot of people thought Syria is far away. If they want to kill themselves, kill each other, let them kill each other, forgetting our values that were on the line. Well, what, what happened was a tremendous refugee flow, a real burden to some of the neighboring countries, particularly Jordan. But uh, then the flow went to Europe, and it's really unsettled uh, the politics and governments of our closest allies in the world, in Europe. I mean, a lot of reasons. You could talk about populism, you can talk about economic dislocation with modern technology, but really a lot of this started because of the reaction to the <coughs> refugees coming from Syria and from uh, North African countries. Uh, and of course, the other thing that happened on a totally, so not only was there human suffering on a totally sort of geopolitical level, we stood back, our allies in Europe stood back, and the Iranians and Russians moved in. Uh, the Iranians had always kind of been there and they expanded their presence. I mean, we're we're, we're contending with them now around this uh, uh, nuclear agreement, but really part of what we're trying to stop is that they, they have been on the move. They're an aggressor throughout the region and they're bringing terrible suffering throughout the region. And, and Putin, you know, uh, uh, McCain and I used to joust with him all the time. It was one of the proudest moments in John's life when Putin's government put him on the uh, list of people that would be arrested if they came to Russia. John, just, I, I, I saw him happy many times. I don't think I ever saw him happier than that day. But uh, look at them, they're now in the middle of the Middle East again, the Russians. Uh, and uh, 
terrible suffering. It's a, it's a wonder. And then we went early on to visit. We couldn't get into, but we went once a little bit because McCain demanded it. You won't be familiar with this. He used to ask, we go to Iraq. We want to go to so-and-so. And of course, there was terrible fighting going on. I don't care what's going on there. McCain wanted it. Uh, so anyway, we went into uh, uh, northern Syria from Turkey for a while, but mostly we met with the Syrian freedom fighters in Turkey and Lebanon, and I know for a while everybody was saying, don't, we can't get involved, they're all radicals, they're really uh, Al-Qaeda and ISIS. You know, uh, in our opinion, uh, the, our judgment on them was that they were freedom fighters, they were, they were, they were Syrian patriots, they were fighting uh, for their own freedom and a better life for their country than they had under Assad, and of course, unlike Tunisia and Egypt, which are their own sagas, where the military refused to fire at the citizens in Syria, Assad's military turned its guns and weapons and chemical weapons on its own people. And uh, you know, you just go on and on, but the, the, the really, the, it's amazing that the flame still burns and it's not too late. And nobody knows the situation on the ground and in the air better than uh, Jennifer, and she's right, it's not over. Assad has not won, and hopefully we can still do something to support uh, our values. It's not only the Syrian people, but our American values, and incidentally, our strategic interests uh, in the Middle East and the world in Syria. One of the most debated issues of the year, uh, which is a tough category to be in, um, is actually uh, President Trump's announcement of a withdrawal of troops from Syria. What is it that US forces actually do on the ground in conflict zones like Syria? And how do they go about advancing American interests and values? Well, our involvement in Syria was really spurred by the effort to defeat the Islamic State, which at that time, of course, controlled a caliphate the size of Great Britain uh, in Iraq and Syria. And so, of course, that was the immediate uh, objective when the Obama administration moved forces back into Iraq and then allowed uh, the early operations in Syria. And I thought very wisely at that time, uh, the then Secretary of Defense, Ash Carter, uh, described the goal as not just the defeat of the Islamic State, but the enduring defeat of the Islamic State. And that is a crucial word uh, that should be added. And we need to ensure that enduring feat. Now, in the case of Syria, we've done it with less, certainly less than 3,000, maybe less than 2,000 actually boots on the ground, certain many others in the air and supporting uh, from Turkey and other countries. Uh, but let's remember that it's not just boots on the ground, it's also civilians on the ground. Uh, and the way you solidify security gains once you have achieved them, once you've cleared an area of Al-Qaeda and, and the Islamic State and other extremists, uh, is you solidify the gains by building on what security allows you to do. That's the foundation. And you then build on that, the restoration of basic services, the reestablishment of local grievance resolution, uh, ultimately schools, health clinics, a variety of other very rudimentary and very basic uh, requirements for a population. Uh, and in this case, we've had some very, very good partners. By the way, we've established what a lot of people hesitated to do for quite a long time, which was establish essentially a safe zone and a no-fly zone, which a lot of people said, oh, this can't be done. We actually have done it. And basically, if you're gonna fly into our area, we're gonna shoot you down. One plane tried to do that. And uh, an Air Force officer got the sweetest thing in the world since I think the Gulf War or something that, you know, he actually shot down an enemy <laughs> fighter. Um, so, and they haven't tried it since. Uh, some ground forces tried to have an incursion and we also uh, dispatched them. So we've created a circumstance, but you have to sustain that now uh, by creating uh, an understanding among the population that their life is better by supporting us or ultimately, the, again, what the Syrian Democratic Forces establish in their local governance than in supporting extremists or other insurgent forces. This has always been the case. It was the case 
in the surge in Iraq, it was the case in the surge in Afghanistan and, and all the rest. Um, military forces, again, therefore, are necessary, but seldom sufficient. And it is all of the other elements, which, which is, you know, General Mattis, Jim Mattis as the Secretary of Defense, had such a wonderful way with words, and he captured this one very eloquently as well. And he said, if you don't give us enough diplomats and dollars for the State Department, you're going to have to give us more bullets. Uh, and so we have to have a balance there so that the other components can be brought to bear uh, to, again, to build on what it is that our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines have secured, in this case, in support of other host nation forces rather than actually doing mo most of the fighting on the front lines. One thing that I had the tremendous privilege of observing while in Iraq and in Afghanistan was the difference between how Americans use force yeah. uh, and how regimes such as the Assad regime, uh, the Iranian allies that it has and the Russian allies that it has use force in a place like Syria. Jenny, can you describe for us uh, the Russian air campaign and can you tell us uh, is the Russian air campaign indiscriminate? Yeah, it's a great question, Kim. Thanks. There is a lot of media coverage that identifies or characterizes the Russian and Syrian airstrikes as the indiscriminate bombing of civilian areas. And in my view, that's an incorrect term because they are deliberately targeting civilian areas. They're targeting civilian areas by dumping large numbers of dumb bombs to hit anything they possibly can. They are targeting civilian populations by pushing barrels full of shrapnel and wire to explode out of planes to literally just hit, kill, and maim anything that they possibly can. But the Russians are also enabling Assad to do something that he was trying to do even more capably, which is to systematically eliminate hospitals so as not only to injure Syrian civilians, but to deny them the life-saving medical care that would actually enable them to either return to their communities or even just survive and flee the conflict to places like Turkey or onward to Europe. The insidiousness of this campaign is intentional. The Russians actually are using precision capabilities against hospitals, not in order to discriminate and hit military targets. They are complicit in Assad's use of chemical weapons, which is actually a component of Assad's campaign against the civilian population, and we actually have a, a new set of credible reports that Assad may have once again used a chemical weapon, this time on a front line near the Syrian coast, which again, the Russians are accountable for. This is not just sectarian displacement. Um, it is depopulation. Yep. Right. Uh, and there's a deliberate use of bombs to cause a large number of casualties, wait until the first responders are there, and then bomb yep. the first responders then wait until they all are taken to the hospital, and then you bomb the hospital. And so when they couldn't defeat part, one of the major parts of the second largest, or it was the largest city in uh, Syria, I guess, Aleppo, uh, they basically depopulated. They yeah. just destroyed that area which they could not gain through normal military means. So General Petraeus, how is it that you, as the commander of US forces in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, saw to it uh, that US forces actually adhered to the laws of armed conflict? Well, I mean, number one, we had a sign on the wall of the operations center from the very beginning, when I was a two-star commander, when I came back as a three-star, and then as the commander of the surge, uh, and, and then also in Afghanistan, and then asked, will this operation take more bad guys off the street than it creates by its conduct? And if the answer to that question was no, you're supposed to go sit under a tree until the thought passes. Um, and by the way, the same applies to policies and firing the Iraqi military without telling them what their future was and firing the Ba'ath Party without having an agreed reconciliation process. Both of those needed to be done. You did, did need to de demobilize and de disarm and reintegrate. You also needed to get rid of a lot of the nefarious Ba'athists, and we were frankly proud to have killed Saddam's two sons when they resisted detention. Um, but if you create more enemies, then you take off the streets by a, an operation or of a policy that is very counterproductive, unless you are willing to do just what the Russians and the Syrians are willing to do, which is just 
kill all, all of your enemies, uh, which is certainly not something that we would countenance. We had rules of engagement that were very strict. Uh, we tried very, very hard to be very precise uh, with our uh, bombing and uh, other weapons. Uh, and, you know, look, we made mistakes, uh, and we then acknowledged those. We would share the results of these with the United Nations, the Red Cross, the other uh, international organizations. Uh, but more importantly, we shared them with ourselves in after-action reviews. Uh, you're never going to eliminate civilian casualties from combat. Um, but you can very much reduce them because, again, this is really a fight for the population. Uh, the, the, the geographic terrain is still very important. It's really important in, in Afghanistan, frankly, if you're going to fight at 14,000 or 12,000 feet. Um, but at the end of the day, the human terrain is a decisive terrain, and both the enemy and the friendlies are trying to persuade them to support uh, their side, and you don't gain folks to your side. We made a ton of mistakes like this in the early days in Iraq uh, with our operations, and then even worse, frankly, with uh, experiences like Abu Ghraib, which is non-biodegradable. Those images will always be on the internet, uh, and uh, there was no justification uh, for that, or frankly, for some of the other Senator McCain and I and, and Senator Lieberman are very strongly opposed to enhanced interrogation techniques. Um, in addition to the counterinsurgency field manual, which we did during that year I was back in the States between the three and four star tours, we also did another manual, which was uh, on essentially the interrogator's manual. It had a different name. And uh, Senator McCain gave it the force of law for the military, and then ultimately the force of law for our entire government. Right. Um, there is n nothing you're going to gain that will be more valuable than what you lose in the eyes of the international community by employing those techniques. I understand why they were done, having said that, and I said that during my confirmation hearing for director of the CIA. I, I knew very intensely what the feeling was after 9-11. I was actually deployed at that time uh, in Bosnia, and I had a U.S. hat, which was a, a special operations task force deputy commander. We actually did the first counterterrorism operation after 9-11, not in Afghanistan, it was in Sarajevo. Uh, and I, we could all feel this pressure that there was something else coming. And, and so I understand how it was that this took place um, very, very much. Uh, but I think with reflection, it's even more crystal clear now uh, than it was uh, a few, even a few years after that, uh, that I think that's another one of the hard lessons that we learned. <laughs> We have a number of wonderful questions coming in at slido.com forward slash Grace Farms. So if you haven't put your wonderful question in there, please do so. Uh, Jenny, you had a comment that you wanted to extend. Oh, I was just going to add, uh, sir, to what uh, General Petraeus had mentioned in terms of the American rules of engagement. I think an important aspect of Assad and Russia's deliberate campaign against the population that bears emphasis is that America's rules of engagement intend to enable the U.S. to win with minimal loss of life. Assad has known, probably since the start of this war, that he can't actually win it militarily. So he has to win it by depopulating his country and terrorizing the rest of his country back into submission. So his use of the airstrikes, Russia's use of airstrikes, is deliberately to cause terror. That's why they are discriminant in the targeting of civilians, and it's such a stark difference from the way that the U.S. military fights that I just wanted to emphasize that point. Please. I'll just I'll share a story, because we're talking about <clears throat> American values, what America stands for. This is on one occasion when uh, Senator McCain, I'm pretty sure Senator Graham was there, and I went to a Syrian uh, refugee camp in southern Turkey. And uh, the American... Um, I guess he was from the military, might have been the State Department, said, I just want to warn you that uh, today, earlier today, uh, a high-ranking official of the United Nations visited this camp, and they threw shoes at him. So uh, just, you know, expect, okay, we said fine, as we're around the corner to go to the camp, there, we hear noises, and there's uh, a lot of shouting. And uh, we get a little closer, and, and they're shouting our names in USA. Because they, they, to us, to them, uh, it wasn't who uh, we are, except maybe McCain, but uh, 
to, to them, America represented their best hope uh, for getting out of those refugee camps, getting back to their countries. Now, we've let them down, really. But I would bet, and they've gotten some help from elsewhere. We haven't, we haven't done nothing, but we haven't done a hell of a lot. They've gotten some support from the uh, Sunni Arab countries. But we're, we're really, um, the message that we talked about earlier, that Sharon had talked about, which is American values, humanitarian values, we still stand for that. We still have a chance to uh, redeem ourselves and, and really uh, save ourselves. Um, the, to me, the foreign policy low point of the Obama administration was when the president drew the red line on Assad's use of chemical weapons, he said he would not let him get away with it. It was clear that he used chemical weapons, uh, Assad did. The president was about to announce we were gonna take military action. And for some reason, he held back. As you remember, poignantly, they sent John Kerry, Secretary of State, out on a Friday afternoon to set it up, gave a passionate, compelling speech, really inspiring to me that why we had to act. <clears throat> and then the president decided that the Congress had to uh, be heard on this. And I tell you, I'm convinced, here, here's a point I want to make from that story, that if the president had ordered some sort of retaliatory strike on some parts of Assad's military uh, intelligence center or wherever they were making the chemical weapons, mm -hmm. um, though if you, at, if you asked in a poll beforehand, should the United States get, get more militarily involved in Syria, uh, probably the numbers would have said more no than yes. But after that kind of action was taken, I bet you it would have been overwhelmingly positive because and this is all about leadership. And you, this is bipartisan. I happen to be talking about Obama, but President Obama. But uh, if you present a case to the American people about why, based on our values and our interests, we should be involved in a place like Syria, then um, they'll, they'll, they'll go for it because that's the vision we have of ourselves. And uh, truthfully, our country could use a little more than our standing up for principle, humanitarian principles, universal principles today than we've had uh, in recent years. <laughs> We have a number of really interesting questions about Iran. What is it that the Iranians hope to achieve in Syria, and how do they to you. try to achieve this? Let me actually start by backing up, and again, I think it's really important to understand uh, Iran perhaps a little better than we sometimes do. We saw, for example, a perfect example last week of the fact that there are, there's not one state of Iran, there are actually two states. And so you have Prime Minister Abe who goes in there, he's going to try to broker some kind of uh, introductory discussions perhaps uh, with the United States uh, in Iran. Uh, he meets with the president of the country who's actually elected, a democratic election, of course, who's allowed to run is a bit restricted. Um, but then there's a parliament, they're elected, uh, they're ministers, this is the visible state. Um, at the same time that he's meeting, almost exactly, uh, the deep state is taking action. And they actually hit two ships, one of which happens to be Japanese flagged. Um, it's a perfect example that the deep state actually controls the policy for Iran for that particular region. Uh, the deep state consists of, of course, all of them report to the supreme leader, uh, but the supreme leader has empowered the deep state for these kind of activities. This is the Re Revolutionary Guards Corps, which has its own, there's an Army, Navy, Air Force over here. There's also the IRGC, Army, Navy, and Air Force. There's the Revolutionary Guards Corps Quds Force, which is a particularly nefarious sort of a cross between the CIA and special operations. Uh, particularly nefarious, as I in fact, when I was the commander in Iraq and they were supporting uh, militias uh, that killed probably six or 700 of our soldiers. Uh, and then you have the besieged militia, which are essentially pipe swingers, headbangers that can clear the streets if they have another green movement kind of situation in Tehran, although they've had spontaneous ones that have been more difficult to control. 
Um, during the Battle of Basra, which is in the second year of the surge, where we're in big fight with the Shia militia, we'd already defeated essentially the Sunni insurgents in Al Qaeda, and we're now we're focusing on that. Uh, I got a message from the Quds Force commander through the president of Iraq, believe it or not. Uh, and the message was, General Petraeus, you should know that I, Qasem Soleimani, he's still the commander, commander of the Quds Force, control the policy for Iran when it comes to Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Gaza, now you would add Afghanistan, and now you would add Yemen and probably the Gulf uh, to that as well. So that is what we are actually dealing with. And we have to be very careful to understand the distinction in who actually is making the policy choices uh, and who will lash out uh, if they are backed into a corner um, sufficiently, but trying to keep it below a threshold in terms of both attribution to them, even though we know it's them, there's no question about that, I don't believe, but it's small enough, it's a few rockets and mortars uh, in different places in Iraq, it's some drones or missiles out of uh, Yemen where the Iranian-supported Houthis are attacking uh, targets in Saudi Arabia, and then it's obviously the two different stripes we've seen against two different ships uh, outside of the Strait of Hormuz and the Gulf of Oman. Um, but with that, we not only have the former senator for 24 years from uh, Connecticut. We also have the chairman of the United Against Nuclear Iran, um, who has been waiting for me to hand the ball to him on this particular question. <clears throat> uh, I'm honored to receive the ball. So, um, look, uh, Iran, uh, Chris, Iran has only been Iran for, what, less than 100 years. It's, it was Persia for centuries. It's, it's a, a country with an extraordinary history and a very gifted people. Uh, and it, was, uh, it wasn't run free by the Shah before, but it was taken over uh, in the revolution in the late 70s by what turned out to be essentially a terrorist group. And uh, a group that uh, had designs, and, I, and uh, Dave's response, I mean, the description of the two forces there is accurate, and I put another touch on it, because they're both uh, threatening to us, to our allies in the Middle East, Arabs and Israelis, and really to the rest of the world. The, uh, the leadership, the supreme leader, Khamenei, and all those around him are theological extremists. I mean, they're, they, you know, when they say death to America, death to Israel, you've got to assume they mean it. Uh, incidentally, uh, the Sunni Arabs, who are, are, are strong allies in the uh, region, think they mean it for sure toward them. I mean, this is a millennial long battle for what is true Islam. Uh, and you've got this group, this country taken over by terrorists. Our State Department, nonpartisan, says they're the, they're the number one state sponsor of terrorism in the world. Incidentally, the, the leadership of Iran is a Shia Muslim, but they're indiscriminate in the kind of terrorist groups they support. They're, they support probably mostly Shia, but they're, happy, they're, they're also very generous to Sunni uh, extremists and terrorist groups as well. And they're stretching out. I mean, from their point of view, they're moving throughout the region. And uh, Syria became an open field for them. Assad needed them. Uh, he was their ally in a sense, because he's also a subgroup of Shia, but uh, they really used him as a way to move Hezbollah in there, and the IRGC. They have tens of thousands of troops on the ground there. I mean, this is a, a strategic advance. I'm, I always shy away from Second World World analogies, but, and I don't know whether it's moving, the Nazis moving into uh, the Czechoslovakia or Poland or whatever, but th they are gaining ground, and uh, it's, it's bad for us and bad for the region if they do. On the other side is the IRGC, which in some ways started out as the, the uh, theocrats' uh, military force, special. They didn't trust the regular army. It's still there, but they still don't trust it. But the IRGC now <clears throat> has become, um, well, like a business. They, they, they have major interest in the economy of the country. So they have yet another reason, not, not theological, to try to hold power. They're, they're really thugs. And um, uh, both are re reluctant to give it up. 
so um, I had somebody from another Middle Eastern country say to me, the only time the Iranians will actually stop their nuclear program, if that's what uh, the U.S. wants them to do, is if they think the survival of their regime is at stake. <clears throat> and um, they haven't come to that point. They may be getting a little nervous about it now. Incidentally, from polling, and it's hard to give it a lot of credibility, that's done in Iran, the regime uh, doesn't have the support of a majority of the Iranian people. They're as frustrated as the Tunisians and the Egyptians and the Syrians were. They're a very educated people, but there's nowhere to go. And um, uh, the problem, as we look forward, what happens now, I mean, obviously you hope that somehow the, the theocrats and the thugs will get worried enough about what our sanctions are doing to their economy <clears throat> that they will come back to the table and negotiate a better uh, nuclear agreement. I don't know how plausible that is, honestly. And uh, then, uh, you know, if the people rise up, which they may, of Iran, of Iran. Uh, unfortunately, we're gonna be at the beginning of something that will look like Syria, but in a much bigger country. In other words, the government will, in my opinion, probably turn its weapons on its own people and uh, just be brutal. And another refugee flow will start to Iraq and a lot of other places around the region and outside of the region. So uh, I, we have allies. We have allies in the Arab world. We have allies in Israel. We have sort of allies in other parts of the world. But um, we're, we're out there <laughs> leading, sort of. <laughs> and uh, it's going to take clear leadership or this is only going to get worse. And our kids and grandkids are going to live in a very different kind of world if uh, the theocrats and the thugs, as I've just called them, are able to keep moving. It's not going to be a pleasant or free place. And keep in mind that what they want to do is the same thing in Iraq and Syria that they did in Lebanon. So they want yeah. to Lebanonize this. And what they did in Lebanon was they built a very powerful militia, Lebanese Hezbollah, which has been very active in Syria as well. Uh, that gives them enormous street power. And then they got enough votes in the parliament through the political process that they actually have with a coalition of some others a blocking veto uh, that they can exercise there. They're trying to do the same thing in Iraq where they have a number of different Shia militia that they've supported. And we do need to be fair to them and note that they did help to push back, the, hold the Islamic State and then push it back uh, and defeat it uh, in, in Iraq. But uh, also have votes in the parliament, and they would love to solidify uh, a coalition there. Syria is a bit more fluid, more dynamic, uh, but again, they want to have that kind of uh, influence and power uh, that can enable them to establish what is essentially its so-called Shia Crescent, where you could move from Tehran through Iraq, through Syria, and then down into southern Lebanon to Hezbollah, and of course then threaten our ally Israel. We have described here an incredible sectarian mobilization uh, that is regional. In fact, it may even be global by ISIS and Al Qaeda on the one hand, by Iran on the other. Uh, we have a geopolitical mobilization uh, as we watch Russia and Iran work with Assad as we watch uh, the United States try to counter and somehow stand between the Kurds and the Turks, uh, as we watch our Gulf allies uh, sometimes help and sometimes cringe at the uh, ways in which um, the Middle East is changing. Um, let's, what is your advice uh, to the president, and what is your advice to Congress at this point? Well, I think, again, you, you, know, you start where I sort of start in the beginning, which is to be very, very cautious <laughs> about um, certainly declaring victory or even being overly, I remember, the, in fact, your colleagues in Congress, you constantly demand, General, are you right. an optimist or a pessimist? And I'd say, I'm a realist. <laughs> Uh, and reality in Iraq is that it's all hard all the time, and I think there's something certainly to that. And frankly, the region, I would contend, is even more complex and even more challenging now. Uh, the key, clearly, is figuring out how to stay involved, because again, this is not something, you know, their, their great ambassador Ryan Crocker, civilian partner, the head of the mission in Iraq during the surge, 
uh, greatest generation, I think, of his diplomat, of his generation, uh, he used to say you can leave the movie theater, uh, but the movie keeps on going, and eventually, you're gonna, in this case, you have to get back into it. So I would also be very, very careful of thinking that we can just withdraw, we can just give it up. Um, and keep in mind, by the way, if we don't engage, uh, if we don't, y y y there was a saying that, you know, it's hard to lead from the rear of the formation. You've sort of got to be out front. Uh, you have to lead by example. Uh, and all the rest. And if we are not doing that, we are not going to see others uh, follow and join in. So I think those are the big overarching uh, ideas here. Um, then you've got to be very, very thoughtful and nuanced in your appreciation of situations. By the way, a great reason, again, to, for the Institute of the Study of War uh, in uh, Washington. But we've got to do this in a way that is, as I said, is sustained, but is also sustainable. Uh, it's taken us quite a while to figure out how to do that, to get the tools that do enable us now to do that, to support partners on the ground rather than doing it ourselves. Uh, I think we've got to take those lessons to heart. But by the way, we also have to acknowledge that this is part of a greater geostrategic situation uh, in which the most important relationship in the world is not that between the U.S. and countries in the Middle East, or even, frankly, now the U.S. and Europe. It's about the U.S.-China relationship. And so if you then draw back all the way uh, and ask how we are uh, conducting these other activities while gradually certainly doing what the previous administration uh, this shift in emphasis, the rebalance to Asia, uh, the Asia pivot, as some titled it, that is crucially important. Uh, and yet another imperative for doing what it is we need to continue to do uh, in the fight, the generational struggle against Islamist extremists, uh, but while doing much, much more uh, to refocus to, again, the crucial relationship between the US and China, keeping in mind that China is not just our biggest strategic competitor, it's also one of our top three trading partners, a very, very different relationship than that which we had with the Soviet Union during the days of the Cold War. And this is a relationship that we have to, uh, I think it has to go forward. This cannot be something, as Professor Graham Allison at Harvard titled a book, Destined for War. Um, not in the nuclear age. And so that has to be the focus. All of our foreign policy should be looked at through a prism that asks what will the effect be on a coherent and comprehensive uh, foreign policy uh, with China, but you cannot leave these others. Um, so it's a matter of keeping many different plates spinning. Uh, we are the the if you will, the guy in the circus, the global circus, who can keep more plates spinning than anyone else. But we have to do an awful lot of these very efficiently while we are keeping that increasingly big plate uh, that is the U.S. relationship with China spinning at ever greater revolutions. Jenny, uh, General Petraeus mentioned that we're in a generational struggle. First, tell us about how our enemies, such as ISIS and Al-Qaeda, are preparing the next generation? Absolutely. Well, the most straightforward answer is, of course, that they are raising their children to believe in this ideology, um, which is a violation um, of all sorts of human rights in the way that these organizations treat children. Um, but Al-Qaeda especially, and the Islamic State as well, is doing something perhaps even more insidious and deadly over the long term, which is investing now in being the only real resistance to the tyranny of Bashar al-Assad and his backers on the ground inside of Syria in order not to liberate Syria from Assad in this generation. I actually think they don't expect a free Syria anytime soon in terms of free from the Assad regime. Wouldn't be free under al-Qaeda or the Islamic State by any stretch of the imagination. But they don't, they don't think they're gonna topple Assad tomorrow. They think the next generation will topple the Assad regime. They are investing now in order to usher in a new wave of the global jihadist movement inside of Syria, using Syria as a crucible, the way the war in Afghanistan was a crucible that birthed the original Al-Qaeda movement. 
It's particularly dangerous because it's a humanitarian narrative. Al-Qaeda recruits soldiers inside of Syria and foreign fighters as well, based on the argument that Assad is a brutal dictator. Join us to fight him, not on religious grounds, not in order to kill infidels, but to fight injustice. It's a very powerful narrative. It's, of course, false, because they are starting to implement their own extreme version of Sharia law inside of Idlib province. They are trying to take away Syrian liberties. They actually attack and have destroyed previously US-backed groups on the battlefield. So these are vicious and evil organizations. But they are fighting the Assad regime. That's how they're setting conditions for the next phase of this war. So I'm very concerned because while we've accomplished near-term gains against the Islamic State, as General Petraeus so rightly noted, we certainly have not defeated its ideology nor its forces. The Defense Intelligence Agency estimated last year that ISIS still has 30,000 fighters across Iraq and Syria. That's how many the CIA public estimate expected ISIS had in 2014 when they seized Mosul. Al Qaeda also has tens of thousands of fighters who aren't viewed as extreme as ISIS is, despite the fact that their ideology is the same. If we do not start to act now to provide desperate populations an alternative to organizations like ISIS and Al Qaeda, populations that are rightly opposed to the, these organizations and their ideology are nonetheless going to start to turn to these groups. These populations are going to start to believe that diplomacy, negotiations with their enemies, is never possible. And they're going to start to believe the false narrative that the entire international community is allied with Bashar al-Assad to massacre the Syrian population. That's what al-Qaeda and ISIS are trying to convince Syrians to support. Not, in al-Qaeda's case, to send suicide bombers into Europe. ISIS is doing that. They'll continue to do that forever. Al-Qaeda is just trying to get Syrians to say, so what? Nobody cared when we were being barrel bombed. Nobody cared when we were being chemical weapon, when chemical weapons were being uh, sent into our homes. So why should we, Syrians, put our lives on the line to fight al-Qaeda? That's the danger that I'm worried about in this next generation. I think there is still incredible sources of resistance on the ground inside of Syria. You see these incredibly brave civilians go out and protest against al-Qaeda while they're being bombed by the Russians and the Assad regime. I mean, that kind of bravery just blows my mind every day. But it's going to, they're going to start to get fatigued, and the radicalization that is going to ensue is going to take far more effort, militarily, diplomatically, humanitarian, to fight if we wait another few years to begin. I am so delighted to have spent time this evening with all of you and with two great leaders of the United States, our armed forces, our Congress. Uh, but I am also extremely uh, moved by what Jenny has described. We have a generational struggle uh, that we are part of. And we, the United States, have a moral responsibility in this generational struggle um, to support uh, those who fight for freedom, to support those who want to make a good life, um, and most of all, uh, to ensure that every human being is treated uh, with dignity and respect. Um, the most powerful experience I've had uh, was actually spending time in General Petraeus's Iraq and going back to a neighborhood, uh, Dora, in southern Baghdad that had been under control of al-Qaeda uh, when I first set foot in the country at the height of the surge in May of 2007. And in February of 2008, I went back to the same neighborhood and where there had been one lone woman on the street walking in her full abaya, obviously having to go out of the house, and it was clearly not safe to do so because it's a city. And when there's no one on the street of a city, you know that something is very wrong. That first time, there was one woman walking down that street. I went back in February of 2008, and I was surrounded by children and their parents. And what had been an Al-Qaeda-controlled neighborhood was liberated for these residents of Baghdad who had lived under this horrible, oppressive Al-Qaeda regime. American soldiers helped to do that, Iraqi soldiers helped to do that, and courageous civilians helped to do that. 
and it transformed the lives of these children uh, who were otherwise living in Iraq. We also have a generational responsibility. Uh, and whether it's through support of the Grace Farms Foundation or support to the Institute for the Study of War, support to the incredible humanitarian organizations that do great work, or in fact, support to the United States of America, which is an idea uh, in which we all deeply believe. We have actions that we can take as part of this generational struggle to help the next generation of leaders in our country actually stand up to the next generation of leaders that our enemies are preparing and to help that next generation of really troubled uh, human beings who have emerged from these conflicts who actually could use a helping hand. So I really want to encourage all of you uh, to act, um, to give your time, uh, and to think about what you can do to support the next generation.